<clears throat> okay. Hey, this is Stefan Kinsella. This will be Kinsella on Liberty episode of 411. And I think in 409, I did part one of this, what probably will end up being a series of talks on intellectual property law. And I've almost never given this talk except to other attorneys in the past. I've always talked to libertarians and others about policy, um, you know, whether we should have copyright patent law. But I figured it would be helpful to people who actually have a might have a practical desire to understand these laws or who want to understand it better to understand the policy arguments better. So I've already covered patent law in the first one. Um, I do realize that in the first talk there was a chat window open, which – let me see if I can open that now, which I missed last time. I'm going to say hello in the chat message make sure it's working. Can everybody see my, my – what I just typed. Okay, because I didn't see that last time, but I got the um, um, Zoom had saved it. Okay, good. <clears throat> Zoom had saved it. So before we get started, let me just briefly mention there was two questions I didn't I didn't see, uh, but I saw it in the log. Um, okay, and it was uh, Matt Brandon Brandenburg asked, "Am I am I saying?" That boat hole designs are a separate category from patent, copyright, and trade secret. Well, it's part of the copyright. It, it was an amendment to the copyright law, uh, I think, with the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the 90s. <clears throat> but it's it's sort of different than copyrights. It's it's sort of the way that the front of a boat or the hole is shaped or designed. So it's similar to copyright, but it's got its own its own rules, which I don't know much about. But anyway. Um, and then Scott asked, uh, should a goal in this type of law be to maximize the incentive to be creative? Now, in this lecture, I'm only talking about how the law works, uh, really. I did talk a little bit about the history, and in my policy talks, I talk about the bad arguments for IP, one of which is the incentive to create. Um, yeah, that is one of the that is one of the arguments given for IP law, especially for patent and copyright. Um, for trademark, it's more about um, um, helping you sell your goods on the market and identify them as coming from you, something like that. But for patent and trademark, uh, sorry, patent and copyright, they both come from um, in the U.S. Anyway, uh, uh, Congress is authorized to make copyright and patent because of the the copyright clause in the Constitution of 1789, which says. Um, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, Congress can pay, make patent and copyright law. So the whole purpose was to promote the progress, yeah, so to give incentive to creators by giving them some kind of property right in what they creatively produce so as to incentive – so they can make more money off of it because they can sell their stuff at a monopoly price if they can stop competition. So yeah, one of the arguments is that um, this is sort of a temporary or a, or, or a, a special uh, – uh, derogation from the common law rules of private property. It's a temporary um, monopoly privilege grant um, designed as a policy tool to try to encourage or stimulate innovation like inventions for patents and artistic works for copyright. So that is the argument. I think the argument is bad, which I'm not going to get into here because that's more of a policy issue. <clears throat> Uh, but you can consult my other writings on this. For example, on my website, um, uh, c4sif.org, go to the uh, Against IP page, and you'll see a, a post about the empirical case against intellectual property, and Greg has joined us now. Um, okay, so those are the two questions I had from last week, but let's let's go to turn to copyright now. So I talked about copy patent last time and then copyright, and now… And last time I gave an overview of the different types of IP law. Um, I forgot to mention I, I am a electrical engineer background. That's how I got into patent law, and I've been practicing patent law and, and other types of IP law like copyright and lic licensing and some litigation support like that um, since um, 1993 um, basically, so 20, 30 years. Um, and again, I talked last time about types of IP. There's copyright and patent. And we'll talk about copyright today. Those are the two big ones. Those are the two worst, the most damaging ones in my view. There's also trademark and trade secret. And I may do another lecture where I talk about all the other types, trademark, trade secret, and then there's others like boat hull designs and semiconductor mask works and database rights and moral rights and geographic 
designations, which is sort of a type of trademark, and special protections and things like that. Um, and again, I'm on page three of my slides, and there's other um, other resources there. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the history of, of modern copyright law. So modern copyright law has been basically in the world um, – I'd say in two phases S since the statute of Anne of 1710 in England and then in the US and then in Western countries since around the beginning of the US around 1790 after the first Copyright Act in 1790 in the US and then other acts like that in Europe followed soon after that. Um, and that was in the US based upon the 1789 constitution, which authorized Congress to to enact such a law. But if we go back a little bit further in history before modern copyright. Um, so you basically – before the printing press, you, you had – the only way that copies of things could be made was by hand. So you had scribes who would like copy things by hand, and because this was laborious and it was usually done by you know religious monks or scholars, of they could be – what they could copy could be controlled by the church or the state or the church and the state working together. Um, but when the printing press in the 1400s and 1500s started becoming more popular, it became an obvious threat to these – to the state and the church of their ability to control what people could see. Like you know, Protestants might not – Protestant rulers might not want the Catholic Bible printed or vice versa, um, <clears throat> or they might not want heresy printed you know, or things that people shouldn't be reading. So what they did was um, – uh, Remember, printing was still difficult. You couldn't print at home. You still had to go to a printing company. So the the, uh, the government in England gave the stationer's company, which was then a kind of an emerging printing firm, um, a royal charter in 1557, and th that lasted for I don't know a little over a hundred years or uh, or so. And during that time, of course, the the, the state could control. What that what the stationer's company would approve to be printed, so they still had a control or a monopoly over over ideas. Um, so it served as a form of censorship. Now, when its charter expired in in the late I think late sixteen hundreds, um, there was a debate about renewing the charter and keeping this going. But it, but by that time, um, there was agitation against renewing it and instead replacing it with a different system, which would give the copyright in works to authors, and so that's what they did with the Statute of Anne in 1710. So it gave the copyright to authors, and they sold it by saying, oh, this is going to help the authors. But of course, uh, all it meant was the authors had to go to the printer, the publishing companies still to get their works printed, and that was still controlled by the, the, the church and the state, especially the state, um, and they had to assign their copyrights. And so… You know, it looked like it gave a right to to authors. Now, what does that look like? That looks like today. You know, many, many book publishers um, uh, have to assign their copyright to a publisher to get it published. Uh, just like for patents, uh, you know, most inventions come from employees, engineers at corporations who, by the virtue of working for them as an employee or signing an agreement, um, uh, have to assign their inventions. Their patented inventions, patentable inventions to their corporations. So, you know, you still end up having the corporations control copyrighted works and um, and uh, patentable inventions. That is starting to break down now, in the in the at least for for copyright because of self publishing and the internet and digital technology and you know print on demand and things like that and online publishing, printing digital copies, writing a blog. Substack, things like that, um, as we'll maybe get to in a bit. But any, in any case, that's the history. So you can see that the history um, of um, of copyright it 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 emerged from the desire of of the powerful institutions, the rulers, the state, basically, to control thought and to censor speech, or well, to censor the, the press, basically. Um, now, and you can think about this. We still have, in addition to this, this this publishing system, where up until recent times most authors were subject to the um, the whims of the publisher. So, for example, I publish several novels, and I might make a, a royalty from the publisher for each each copy sold, but they own the copyright usually. Um, and so, if the book goes out of print and the publisher doesn't want to renew it, then the book just disappears, and I can't do anything about it because even I, as the author or my heirs. Don't own the copyright, so they would be infringing copyright to republish it, right? Um, and um, um, 
you know, it's led to the orphan works problem where, you know, works disappear because uh, you don't know who the author was and no one is, everyone's afraid to republish this, this out of print book, um, et cetera. So, so it led to that, but also like it's led to this whole thing of uh, academic publishing where, you know, most of the uh, scholarly type work uh, is done by academics and scholars in the past who are employed by universities. And they tend to publish their works in scholarly journals or in books with academic presses. And the reason they do that is to – and they don't usually get paid for this. right? They're doing it just to advance their careers and to get their, the ideas out there, and they publish in these journals and these publications even though they're priced at a very high price because that's how they get tenure and promotions. Uh, that's how their universities grade them basically. Um, so they they give their work for free to these academic presses, which then print the books and sell them to libraries at colleges and universities at exorbitant prices, which the university libraries can afford. So it's like an unholy alliance between, you know, the taxpayers are are, are forced to subsidize the universities quite often. That money pays teacher salaries, and it also funds library budgets, which are used to buy books at inflated prices from academic presses. But what this means is these books just gather dust in these libraries, which the average person or the person from a poor country, you know, can't afford to to get to, and they can't. And even nowadays, they can't afford to buy the book because it's too expensive. Um, so it's led to basically, uh, you know, a stifling of the spread of information. So you have this professor who he might get a promotion or academic. Um, uh, tenure or something from this, but his ideas don't really get spread except to other academics. Um, and again, this may be breaking down as more and more open source journals come online and things like this. Um, so that's that's where we are right now. Um, and if you want to read into this more, I have a couple of links here. There's a great article by Carl Fogel about this and uh, some others I've linked here to Eric Johnson. Um, as Eric Johnson wrote, uh, wrote um, in a law review article about 10 years ago. The monopolies now understood as copyrights and patents were originally created by royal decree, bestowed as a form of favoritism and control. As the power of the monarchy dwindled, these chartered monopolies were reformed, and essentially by default, they wound up in the hands of authors and inventors. But again, as I said, they they, they wound up in the hands of authors and inventors nominally, but in practice, they ended up being reassigned back to the publishers or to the employers. Um, by the way, I want to make sure uh, – someone just say something or type in the chat. Make sure everyone's hearing me cor correctly, correct? Yeah. Yep. Okay, and if, if feel free to interrupt me, by the way, when I'm speaking. I will do a Q&A at the end, but if you, if you see something you really want me to address right now, feel free to interrupt me um, as long as it's not too much. And I will try to get to the questions in the chat. I see there are some here. Um, Matt writes, Matt Brandenburg, I think the arbitrariness of the subdivisions of IP law show that it's just a made-up concept not based upon any real-world type of property that can be owned. That is true, and the arbitrariness not only of the different types but of each type. So the, the boundaries of you know, – like, for example, the term of patent is about 17 years, totally arbitrary. The term of copyright is… Now it's life of the author plus 70 years. It used to be the life of the author plus 50 years. And before that, it was um, uh, in the beginning of the country, which Tom Bell calls the founder's copyright, which we may get back to. It was about 14 years, extendable once if you applied for it by another 14 years, so 28 years max. But basically in the founding – in the beginning of the country, patents lasted about 17 years and – I think they lasted 17 years. I actually can't remember, but something like that, and copyrights were 14 usually, and – the reason that the 14-year the copyright term came about was – the theory is – I'm not sure if this has been proved, but this is the theory um, because it's an arbitrary number. How do you pick the right you – know, if Congress is going to make up a brand new copyright law, how long do they make it last for? They didn't want to make it last forever because that would obviously be harmful, just like a $100 minimum wage is obviously harmful, so they can get away with a $14 one because it doesn't hurt too much. It's not too visible. It's the same thing with copyright. You know, So they came up with a 14-year term. Uh, and the theory goes that um, back in those days, it was common to have apprenticeships like indentured servitude and apprentices, someone who would serve under uh, – I don't know what they call the the, the master or the employer. Um, 
and learn the trade, but they would serve them while they were learning. They were kind of learning on the job. And the terms of pr apprenticeships were seven years, and usually there would be – you would have two terms, or you'd have two apprentices, maybe one apprentice, and then another one follow him. So the idea was that someone who is teaching his craft to his, his, his apprentice should be protected from competition from them when they leave his – their 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 apprenticeship and they go they start competing with him. He should be protected for the length of two apprenticeship terms. You know, so yeah, it's completely arbitrary. <laughs> um, so it's funny when you see these critics of patent and copyright who pretend to be radical uh, reformers and firebrands, uh, who none of them favor patent and copyright abolition, but they want to put they want to pose as like we're some maverick or there's some radical reformer like uh say Alex Tabarrok, who's this uh allegedly free market guy from from Mercatus or, or George Mason. And he you know he draws this thing. I think I've got a a, a, a link to uh, I've got a, a blog post on this on c4sif.org called something like patent policy on the back of a napkin. And he draws this sort of Gaussian curve showing the benefits of a of patents given their term and if you go start at zero like you don't have patents at all there's no benefit but then the benefit goes up and up and up to a peak and then it goes down if you have too long of a term and he just draws that gaussian curve and says oh we're on the other side of the of the of the optimum so patent ter uh, patent terms are too long or copyright terms i can't remember which one and so we need to shorten it but how does he know what the optimum is it's just totally arbitrary and there's no reason given whatsoever uh, it's like he wants to say we should lower the term, but he has no basis for that because if you think there's a peak, maybe we're on the left side of the peak. Maybe we should increase patent terms and copyright terms. Uh, now, if you believe the optimal term is zero like me, then it's easy to see that the lower the term, the better we are because it's like taxes. The If you believe in no taxes at all, then if we have 40 percent, then 30 percent is even better, and then 20 percent is better than that all the way down to zero. But if you believe in this sort of a peak somewhere or an optimum like, like most – you know, state many statists do. Like, you know, Arthur Laffer had the Laffer curve saying tax revenues are too high. We're killing the cow. We're killing the goose that lays the golden egg. We need to lower taxes and we'll get even more revenue out of the people. That was under Reagan, you know, this Laffer curve idea. So this is what some of these these reformers say is we have a Laffer curve type thing for intellectual property, but we're on the far side of it. But they don't know. So it's all arbitrary. All right. So done with that little question. Let me return to where I was. Now I'm on slide seven. Okay. I'm going to talk about U.S. law mostly, and most other countries' laws are similar due to treaties, which require all the countries who are members, which are most countries in the world, to have similar minimum standards. And the U.S. was either the first or one of the first, and it's been emulated by a lot of countries anyway, so the U.S. is a good model. So as I mentioned earlier, so uh, in, in the patent law lecture, the Constitution, which was ratified in 1789, the reason I keep mentioning that is because the first Patent Act was uh, was made the very next year in 1790, but also because in 1791, under the next Congress, because every two years there's another Congress in the U.S., uh, under the next Congress, the Bill of Rights was was ratified, the first ten amendments to the Constitution, and the First Amendment restricts it says Congress can't en enact a law that abridges freedom of the press, right? Uh, which is clearly in conflict with the Copyright Act of 1790, which was which was enacted a year before, based upon the 1789 Copyright Clause. And the Supreme Court has recognized that, as common sense shows, there's an obvious tension between or conflict between a law that pre prevents you from publishing a book, like copyright law says you cannot print this book because it copy it, it's 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 it would be a copy of someone else's book or a derivative work. So copyright law literally prevents people from publishing books, which you would think is an abridgment of freedom of the press, which the, the First Amendment prohibits. So there's a conflict between these laws. Now, under, under principles of statutory interpretation and constitutional interpretation, um, these are called canons, C-A-N-O-N-S, of, of interpretation. Um, when you have two laws in conflict, the later one is the one that prevails because that's how laws get overturned. Is you pass another law later that overturns the earlier law. If the later law didn't have priority, then you could never overturn a law. In America, the Constitution had an amendment prohibiting alcohol in 1923 or something, and then 1933, another amendment was enacted overturning the earlier one. So the, it, when you have a later amendment to a Constitution that, that is in conflict with an earlier one, then the later one is the one that has to win. So 
you could make an argument that the, the entire copyright law is unconstitutional because it's outlawed by the First Amendment. But unfortunately, the Supreme Court doesn't do that. They, they say, well, we have to balance them because they were enacted so close in time, we can't assume that Congress meant to overturn copyright law, blah, blah, blah. But in my view, an originalist understanding of the Constitution and, and, a, and, a, and a liberty loving and a liberty leaning and a liberty presumptive Supreme Court ought to say, listen, unfortunately, um, Copyright can't survive in the face of the First Amendment, so if we have to choose. We're going to choose the First Amendment. I wish they would do that, but they haven't. And not only the First Amendment, also the Eighth Amendment for cruel and unusual punishment because the damages – the damages that can be awarded under statutory damages for copyright infringement are insane, $150,000 per infringing act, which is no relationship to actual damage done, etc. So I think that violates the Eighth Amendment. It probably violates the Fifth Amendment on due process. It violates uh, maybe some other provisions as well. Um, in any case, co Constitution authorized it. The next year, Congress passed the Copyright Act, which is now – the modern act is now in Title 17 of the United States Code, U.S. Code. Uh, the Copyright Office is what runs and handles um, the copyright system in this country, um, at least for registrations, and oddly enough, it's part of the Library of Congress, which is a kind of like a library of Congress. Which is the legislative branch of the U.S. government, which is odd, right? Because you have an executive. You know, when laws are enacted by Congress, they're executed by the executive, the executive branch, and yet the copyright um, office is in the Library of Congress. It's kind of a weird fluke of history. Um, for example, uh, patents and trademarks, federal trademarks in the patent system, which are also federal. Laws enacted by Congress, they're administered by an executive agency, the Department of Commerce, right? Which makes more sense. So it's not clear to me why copyright wouldn't be under the Department of Commerce. But I, I guess they thought when you had to register works, and people still do register them sometimes, they had to be held somewhere. So they were held in this repository, which is the Library of Congress, which keeps other records of the of the federal government. So it's just kind of odd. All right. Now, there's a, there's a ton of other U.S. laws that, that touch upon copyright. I won't get into detail. I've got them listed here with some links, um, but there's the, the NET Act, the No Electronic Theft Act, which has criminal criminal fines and $250,000 in fines and criminal uh, possible prison term. Uh, uh, the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act, called sometimes called the Mickey Mouse Extension Act or uh, Protection Act because the, the theory is that Disney Corporation has a lot… Of its capital or its value in its copyrights in Mickey Mouse and its other creations. And every time Mickey Mouse's copyright is about to expire, they lobby Congress to tack on another 20 years to the to the system. So it used to be life of the author plus 50 years. And then in 1998, right when Mickey Mouse was about to enter the public domain, 20 years were tacked on to it. Um, so, and I think I'll get to this later, but in the U.S. system, in most of the world, it's life of the author plus 50. It's 70 in some countries, but uh, the U.S. is more aggressive, of course. Um, now, in the case of a work for hire where the author is a corporation, and I'll get to that in a bit, um, the term is 95 years or 120 years depending upon when it was published. Um, now, in the 90s, the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, was passed, and uh, part of it is called OSILA, the Online Copyright Infringement Limited Liability Limitation Act. That's the safe harbor provision. People, uh, you probably heard people talking lately about Section 230 of the CDA, the Communication Decency Act. That is a safe harbor for internet service providers to not be liable for defamatory comments of their users. Like if you have a a website and you have a comment section, and someone posts something in the comment that is defamatory, that defames someone, then they're liable if you can find them, but the the publisher or the, the 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 platform that hosts that is not liable under the CDA under Section 230. This is what a lot of conservatives and even some post libertarians want to uh, change to make the tech companies, which they now hate, more liable for the comments of their users, which is a bad idea, as I've written on, on some posts. Um, and and the DMCA had one like that for copyright. It was a little bit different. It's not as broad as the – well, it's not as unrestricted as the CDA Section 230 for defamation. The copyright says you're, 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 uh, you're, you're, you're isolated from um, um, liability for 
copyright infringing acts of your users who use it on your platform. Like you, you can't be sued for, uh, say, secondary infringement liability for your users posting a copyrighted work on your website as long as you take it down when you get a notice. This is why all these big publishers like YouTube, they instantly take down anything if there's any threat, even if it's an unsubstantiated threat by a robot. Um, they take it down because they don't want to take the chance that they lose their safe harbor protection, and it might be an actual copyright infringement. If they don't take it down, then they could be secondarily liable because they lost their safe harbor under the DMCA. So the DMCA has made these platforms like Google and uh, you know websites with comment sections, uh, publishing platforms, um, and um, um, YouTube just have a trigger – Trigger finger, just take things down as soon as they get um, a, a, a takedown notice. And there's almost no liability for, for posting a takedown notice if you're wrong. So, uh, so you have all these media companies. They have these robots that just search, and they just send a notice out. And I think I've read that – let me go to page uh, – I don't know where it is. But I think there's something like one point, up to 1.5 billion takedown notices sent to YouTube every year. It's it's insane. Um, I know they take down millions of videos per year because of this. Um, so – oh, the DMC, I think I mentioned earlier. It also – that's where it added the vessel hull, the boat hull designs uh, protection. Uh, now, I talked about this last time too. I've got some blog posts just outlining all these – Mountain of IP legislation, both domestic and all and, and international treaties. So the major international bodies that sort of administer these things or, or promote these things are, are the WTO, the World Trade Organization, which tries to liberalize trade, but when they do so, they they require companies to have strong IP rights. It makes no sense. Trade literally has nothing to do with um, um, with internal property rights. So, for example. If China doesn't have strong property rights because you have to get license, a, uh, a license, to, you have to get permission from different layers of government to open a factory there to, or to start a business there. Uh, that is not that is not a free market, and that's not good. But it's got nothing to do with free trade. Like, however, that country makes goods, they can ship it to the U.S. if there's free trade between these countries. So, free trade agreements like bilateral investment treaties. Uh, uh, well, uh, let's just talk about the free trade. Free trade agreements really have nothing to do with the internal property rights in a, in in different countries, but they use the leverage. Like the, they say, if you're going to open up free trade with the U.S., if you want access to our markets, <clears throat> you need to have American style IP rights. <laughs> uh, then there's the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is a UN agency which also deals with intellectual property. Now, the major treaties, some of which are administered by these 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 bodies. Um, for for copyright, the major treaty is the Berne Convention, which was first enacted in 1886 by European countries, and the U.S. oddly enough resisted joining until 1989. The reason, part of the reason, was because you know, um, well, we didn't want to we didn't want to have the moral rights provisions which the Berne Treaty tried to impose on countries that joined. Uh, we didn't mind the minimum copyright provisions and giving reciprocity respecting the rights of foreign authors although at first we didn't want to do that because you know in the fledgling days of the country uh we protected american authors but for, foreign books could be pirated left and right and so there was some opposition to losing that freedom yeah. to do that we finally gave into that and i think we gave in to the Berne convention in 89 because we were able to uh, to not have to be subject to sorry, sorry that's my poodles um to not have to be subject to the um, to the moral rights provisions. Moral rights is sort of this weird European thing where, in addition to being able to stop people from copying your work, which by the way you can sell that right, you can assign it or get rid of it. Like so, if I sell you a book, then I've given you a license for that copy, and you can do whatever you want with the book. You can resell it under the first sale doctrine and stuff like that. Uh, or if I if I'm an author and I assign my copyright to a publisher, I've lost my copyright. Like you can sell it. It's alienable, but moral rights in in Europe are, are things that are called considered inalienable, and that in, they're related to copyright, but they're not the, they're not copyright itself. They're related to your your act of creating a copyrightable work, and those rights are things like attribution, like the right to always be given attribution or credit, be accredited as the one who made it. Um, and those are inalienable. You can't even sign that away. And the other one would be the right to like 
prevent your work from being defaced or, or destroyed. I mean, there's these crazy cases where, you know, like some some artist paints a mural on a refrigerator or he has an apartment where he painted a mural and he sells the apartment to someone or he sells a refrigerator to someone. And then he learns 15, 20 years later that, you know, the owner of the apartment wants to demolish that wall or to paint over it or they want to paint over the refrigerator. He can like get a court order to stop them from doing that because he has this inalienable moral right to not have his work defaced. Uh, there's a there's a lawsuit going on in some museum somewhere where the museum they 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 can't destroy the mural but they don't want to show it anymore so they they're putting up these big banners in front of it and the question is is that defacing it or something so it's crazy and so the U.S. that was one impediment to the U.S. joining now. So the, the Berne Convention imposes minimum standards like you have to recognize the types of works like you know uh, artistic works, paintings, writings, um, motion pictures, audio recordings, <clears throat> and it also abolished um, also minimum terms like I think it's life of the author plus fifty is the minimum term in there or something like that. The U.S. has gone beyond that to seventy. Um, it also abolished formalities, which was one of the worst things it did. Um, before the Berne Convention or before the U.S. Ex acceded to the Berne Convention, um, under U.S. copyright law, you used to have – to get a copyright, you had to do two things. You had to put a copyright notice on it to tell the world, I'm the author, so so then everyone knows who to contact if you want permission. So the author is the person who stamped their name on the copyright notice, and then you know the date because you put copyright you know, 1972, so you know the date, which can be useful for um, – for attribution and for for no and knowing when it's going to expire under the old regime, and also you had to register it. So you had to send a copy to the Library of Congress or the, the Copyright Office and register it. So then there was a record of what the copyright work was, what you're claiming. That was abolished in the Berne Convention. So that's why you still see copyright notice because there are some advantages to doing it, but you don't have to. Um, and also because it's just a legacy or a relic from the old days, and most people are, are clueless about copyright law. They don't understand it. So you'll have laymen say to me, for example, Kinsella as an author who has a copyright notice on some works, and I do it for a certain reason. Um, but they say, oh, Kinsella, you're against copyright, but you're a hypocrite because you're copywriting your work. They don't understand. They're, they're ignorant. Copyright is not a verb anymore. Copyright is a noun. You have a copyright in a work, and it's automatic. As soon as you write something and you put it down on a piece of paper or you type it on your computer, as soon as it's fixed in a tangible medium of expression, you have a federal copyright whether you want it or not. So um, this has led to all kinds of problems like the orphan works problem, etc. Okay, you also have the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. The 1994 round covered IP, which resulted in TRIPS, the Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of IP. That's TRIPS, and that also has minimum standards too. And then there's the Universal Copyright Convention, which was an alternative to the burn, but the burn has sort of won out as far as I know. Uh, I've got other links here for things people are interested in. There's also the practice in the last 40 or so years of countries implementing what's called bilateral investment treaties. There's a web of thousands, probably tens of thousands of these things around the world because they're bilateral. So the U.S. has bilateral investment treaties with with dozens, if not over 100 countries in the world, which is, is like a little mini free trade agreement with those countries. And then France might have one with 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 UK. And so like all these dyads or pairs of of agreements, there's there's I think thousands of them, maybe maybe over 10,000 in the world. Um, a lot of them follow the same model, but a, a lot of the Western ones, especially the American ones, basically impose on the other country. Like I mentioned earlier, they impose. Uh, requirements that this other country uh, beef up their IP system and start enforcing it better or have stronger penalties or have terms similar to the U.S. Uh, so basically they're doing this at the behest of the American – the three of the strongest lobbies in America uh, and the driving force behind intellectual property rights being spread around the world to countries that don't benefit from it, but they have to do it because the U.S. basically coerces them to do it or or extracts it as a price of – Doing business with us through a bilateral investment treaty or some other way, um, uh, and the, these lobbying industries would be probably to today's world primarily the pharmaceutical industry, and that be for patents. They fight tooth and nail to have strong patent protection, and then the um, you know uh, the music industry and Hollywood um, publishing industry for copyright. 
Um, so in a sense, the Hollywood and the music industry and the and the pharmaceutical industry primarily in the US have driven IP policy all around the world and what I call uh, intellectual property imperialism. I've got some links here at the bottom of page slide 10 um, about how um, uh, like Japan – during the, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Trump killed for the wrong reasons, <laughs> he, it should have been killed because it had a strong IP chapter in it, and again… A trade agreement should have nothing to do with the local the, the local country's internal domestic patent or copyright law. It has not, it's their, that's their own property rights system. It has nothing to do with trade. Um, but uh, I think actually Canada during – just to get a seat at the table for the TPP negotiations, which ended up falling apart. But during that process, Canada like actually added 20 years to their 50-year – Life of the author plus fifty year term for some of some copyright works just to appease the United States. So you see they have this effect. Um, anyway, I call this IP imperialism. Okay, so let's talk about how copyright law works and what it is. Um, okay, so the scope that is what is what does copyright law protect? So patents. Patent law protects inventions. That's practical machines or processes, right? Trademarks protect. Marks, which identify the source of goods, you know, like Coca Cola, something like that. Uh, trade secrets is just a kind of a way to protect uh, proprietary information that you keep secret, a company keeps secret, uh, that they try to keep secret that gives them a co competitive advantage. So they're different. Um, uh, copyright protects basically creative works. Okay. Um, let me go to, to slide. Yeah, I'm going to go to slide 14 for a second. So the requirements are copyright. It has to be a work. We call it a work. It's a thing that you a, an author produces from his mind, his intellect. Um, it's got to be original, have a, some some small spark of creativity, and it, it doesn't have to be big because that's why photographs. There was a debate about whether photographs should be copyright because they're just like a factual representation of what the world is like. You know, the light rays bounce off objects, go through a lens, and mechanically hit. Uh, you know, a photographic, you know, plate or uh, CMOS sensor or something, and it just records what's out there. So, what's the creativity in that? So, the you know, photographers, of course, say, "Oh no, it's very creative." The the lighting, the aperture, the the timing, blah blah blah. And so, you know, even a very small degree of creativity. And same thing with software code. I mean, software code. It was there was a debate about whether um, source code for a software program, which is functional, right? Because it just tells a machine how to work. Um, whether that would be copyrightable too, um, because is there any creativity in just telling a machine how to do something? But then, of course, you know the argument is well, there's a little bit of creativity, so there's just a smidgen, and that's enough. Um, so you have to have some originality. And by the way, you have to be the author. This is why people are also confused about copyright. They'll say, "Well, I have to copyright my stuff," which is confused because you don't copyright anything; it's automatic. But they'll say, "Well, you have to copyright your stuff because if you don't, someone else might copyright it." What? But they, that's not true. You you can't you can't get a copyright on someone else's work even if you copy it because you're not the author. So you have to be the author, and it has to be your original work of authorship. You have to fix it, so you can't just like have a chorus. Or you can't talk and just say you have a copyright what you said because it, it's not recorded. It's not fixed. You got to write it down or you got to record it somehow. Um, and it's also going to be – you get a protection on the expression of your ideas but not on the underlying ideas themselves. So we'll come back to that with something called the merger of ideas and expression doctrine. Okay, I'm going back to um, slide 11. So the types of things that can be covered by copyright have now been recognized either under the statute or under judicial decisions to be – Writings like a book, whether fiction or nonfiction, photographs, paintings, you know, you're a painter, you make a painting, um, software code, musical compositions, sound recordings, which are different than the composition, right? They're two different things, two different copyrights, which is why sometimes getting permission for a song is difficult because you have to get two sets of permission. Um, I'm not an expert on this, but that's that's good enough. Uh, motion pictures like movies, film. Um, and architectural works, and probably some other things too, like boathole designs, which are sort of like not exactly the same, but somewhat. Now, in the beginning of the country, 1790, the found this 14 year copyright, which had to have a notice and had to be registered, only covered maps, charts, and books. That's it. It didn't cover movies, which didn't exist yet. Didn't cover photographs, which didn't exist yet. Didn't cover painting. 
I don't think it covered paintings or sculptures or plays, music, sound recordings. There weren't sound recordings yet. Didn't cover architectural works. Didn't cover boat hull designs. Didn't cover software. There wasn't software yet. Um, that's why Tom Bell, who's a libertarian law professor, uh, uh, he's also not an abolitionist, but he he supports reform as well. But he 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 advocates that we return to the founders' copyright, which would be granted, admittedly. Um, it's someone here. It would be admittedly a big um, um, a big improvement. Let me let me check the chat real quick. See if there's anything I need to address. Um, Oh, the inventor has an advantage because they start producing for everyone else. Yeah, the first mover advantage is is, is a big advantage. That's true. Uh, collages barely create anything new. That's true, but it's probably enough because you have to have some artistic choice in where you put the little picture. So yeah, you can get a, a protection on that. Um, I'm not going to get into the first mover advantage because that's more about the policy. That's more about rebutting the bad arguments for IP that without IP you wouldn't have. You wouldn't have people produce things, which is clearly false because expect, let's say copyright. Uh, in today's world, although there is copyright law, because of uh, piracy, it, because it's so easy to pirate now with with the internet and with uh, with uh, I don't know all the terms Tor browsers and uh, encryption and all this stuff. Um, piracy is rampant and widespread. So every time you make something, you know you're doing it. When people can copy and pirate it, and yet people still make tons of stuff and they make lots of money off of it. So it's clearly possible. Um, anyway, going on to slide um, 12. Uh, I'm not going to do this, just shows uh, 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 when. Um, when different types of works uh, started being protected, you know, books, maps, and charts in the beginning, and then later on in time, other things started being added. Um, 1790. I think some of my formatting is off here, but uh, you can see how um, over time more and more things were added to the scope of copyright. Uh, now, you can you cannot get copyright in things covered by other types of IP like inventions, patents are for that, um, or for slogans, trademarks are for that, or private information that's not because it's not published. It's got to be. It's got. Well, it doesn't have to be published, but it has. It's got to be fixed in a in a. Um, yeah, this might actually be wrong. I'm gonna have to adjust that. Private information can be copyrighted if you write it down. Um, but if you're keeping it, something is a trade secret. It's just a proprietary information that's trade secret. It's not necessarily copyrightable. Um, you can't get a, a copyright in mere ideas, only in their expression. So you know, if someone writes a book explaining um, some theory they have. Then someone else is free to re to write their own book, elaborating or even restating that theory in their own words, but they can't copy the way it was expressed by the first author. Uh, you can't get a copyright in facts, mere factual information, which is why the photographs were, were – it wasn't clear whether photographs were copyrightable in the beginning. Short phrases can't be copyrighted just because they're just too short, and they would limit how people can use language. Same thing with titles, like titles of movies or books. Um, you can't get a copyright on that. Which is why there's – you'll quite often see the same title used for multiple copies of, of some work, like a same novel with the same word. Like I, there's like four or five movies out there with the, with the title Nefarious. There's a brand new one called Nefarious. Sometimes the producer will add a subtitle to distinguish it, but everyone's free to use the same title, just like people could name their kid John. You know, There's a million Johns in the world, so what? Um, now, go back to that first one, Ideas. You can't get a copyright in ideas, and so if there's a certain type of idea that can only be expressed in one way or in a very limited number of ways, then you can't get a copyright on the expression either because it's so, they're said to be called a so-called merger of ideas and expression. In other words, if you were to give someone a copyright in the way that they express this idea, you are effectively giving them a copyright in the idea because there's no other way to explain it or to describe it. So it, one example would be like… A recipe for food maybe or the rules of a game, like how many ways are there to explain the rules of a certain simple game? You, you have to use language to explain it, and anyone explaining the rules of a, of a well-known game, they're probably going to use very similar language. So if you had a copyright on the language, on the way it's expressed, no one can explain the rules of this game except for you, and that's not prohibited. That's not that's not what copyright is for, for. Also, there's no copyright in public domain works, works that are very old. 
uh, or works that are in the U.S. published by the federal government. Like there's a statute saying the federal government um, disclaims or cannot own or have copyright anything that the federal government produces. That's why there's no copyright in, say, statutes enacted by the federal government, which makes sense, right? The, go the government in, uh, passes things that affect us all. We should have a right as citizens to copy them so that we can spread the word about what what uh, policies of the government um, affect us, right? Although I believe some states in the U.S. do not have that rule, so they they can copyright things, which I think is bizarre. I've already went through the requirements for copyright earlier. Okay, 15. Now, what are the copyright rights though? So what copyright covers? It, it covers the right to copy. That is, you can, you can stop someone from making a copy of your copyrighted work uh, or something substantially similar. So the exact duplication would be called literal, literal copyright infringement. Uh, but you also can't just make minor changes and get a, get a, get out of it. That would be called substantially similar copying. Uh, and it also covers derivative works. That is like uh, – so if I have a copyright in a novel like Jaws um, – well, I don't know if that's a good example. I don't know if Jaws was a novel first. Let's say it was a novel. Um, and then s s someone can't – Someone can't. If someone would were to make a movie based upon Jaws, that would be a derivative work. It's not a copy of it, but it's a derivative work. It's based upon the original, and that is also an exclusive right of the author. And also, there's performance and distribution rights and things like that. So the bundle of rights themselves uh, would be the right to reproduce or copying, the right to make pair derivative works, to distribute copies, to perform them publicly, to display them publicly, and a, and there's a special one that's fairly recent in the last decade or two. The right to perform publicly sound recordings by digital audio transmission. Okay, this just makes all this stuff just makes jobs for copyright lawyers because it's hard to understand this stuff. So if you're in the business, you have to go to one of us to help you out. <clears throat> now, there's also an ins uh, so basically violating a copyright right is called infringement, and this is the bottom of this page, sixteen slide sixteen. It's best. It's you know most people. Call it informally. They'll say ripping off someone or stealing their work when you commit copyright infringement, but that's technically incorrect. Um, under the law, it's simply called infringement. It means you have done something that the law deems to be an infringing act, and there are certain um, consequences of that, like you have to pay a fine or might maybe go to prison. But it's not. It's actually not theft. And the Supreme Court has explicitly said this. They say this. It's, it's not theft because you're not depriving someone. You're not taking something. Although people use that term too, they'll say he took my work. It's like, well, if I took it, why do you still have a copy? You know. So words like take and piracy and theft and stealing and ripping off are actually literally dishonest and inaccurate, and they're legally inaccurate too. So it's called infringement. Same thing with patents. It's called patent infringement and copyright infringement. Now, there's an exception or a defense to infringement. Even if you do infringe um, a copyrighted work, which is in the scope of copyright, it's still within the copyright's term. Um, you have one defense, and that's the fair use defense. It's an affirmative defense, which means you have to make the defense if you're sued. And the way the court would decide whether or not you have a defense is they they're given four factors, which is a non-exclusive list. What happened was the courts came up by common law. The courts came up with this list of factors in, in jurisprudence, just in case law, uh, in the beginning of the country. And there was a, a patent law passed. Uh, I can't remember which year, probably in the 1900s, which codified the four factors that had been judicially developed. But they said these are not exclusive. Like there might be another factor you might want to consider. But they're telling judges you got to consider at least these four factors and weigh them together in a balancing test to decide. And the the four factors are. And they're all vague and arbitrary. This is why no one knows for sure whether or not a given use of a work is fair use, except in clear cases. Um, and what this means is because it's an affirmative defense, the burden of proof is on the, the defendant or the victim of a copyright lawsuit uh, to defend themselves, and they can't be sure they're going to win because these, these, these rules are vague. And so they are, for example, number one is the purpose and character of the use, including whether it's commercial or – for nonprofit educational uses. Okay. So if it's for nonprofit use, that's weighs in the that weighs in the balance of, of the favor of the of the infringer. The nature of the work, you know, whether it's like something that's um, uh, highly profitable, like a brand new Hollywood movie or something, something else. Um, the amount of it that you copy, the portion. Like so if you only copy a page or two out of a of a of a novel, did you really 
you know, that might weigh in your favor. If you copy seven chapters out of it, that might weigh in the in the in the author's favor. And then the effect on the potential market. So for example, this is going on right now with this Prince photograph. I think it's complicated, but um Andy Warhol, okay, there was a photograph taken of Prince by a photographer. She licensed the the photograph to him, I think to a magazine. I forgot the name of the company. <clears throat> uh and then the Andy Warhol, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, the Prince uh I want to say the Prince uh the Prince Estate licensed to the Andy Warhol Estate or so, the Andy Warhol the right to do these um the kind of like these Marilyn Monroe type kind of like uh a neon looking watercolors or something based upon that photograph and he sold them so now the question is um is is there fair use in Andy Warhol being able to use that photograph and so one of the questions is is it transformative like if you look at the fourth factor does it affect the potential market so the question is if you want to use that photograph to illustrate an article about prince you would have to go pay the whoever owns that photograph copyright um um uh, a license fee to use that photograph. Instead, you could just use the Andy Warhol one and pay a license to the Andy Warhol Foundation. So, is it a substitute or not? And you could, you know, the argument now, and I think it's still in litigation, is, and of course, there's no objective answer. So, wh whatever the judge decides is going to be arbitrary. But the question is, is it a transformative work and is it different? And I, I think you could argue it's different because you might want to use the Andy Warhol thing to make a different social commentary or to illustrate one type of article, but the photograph to illustrate another type of article. But in some cases, it really wouldn't make a difference. You know, So it's, it's, there's no objective bright lines here because these laws are arbitrary and vague. All right, going on to slide 17. Um, I already mentioned the safe harbor, so uh, uh, let's, let's skip that. Uh, and I've already mentioned the term. It used to be 14 years, extendable once. Now it's the life of the author plus 70. Or if the corporation, which is a work for hire, which I'll get to in a second, it's 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation, whichever is shorter, which is usually the 95 years. Okay. Uh, now, who who owns a copyright? It's usually the author unless he assigns it to someone later. The author is the creator and this is a weird quirk in the law. If you're an employer where there's a work for hire, which like you're employed by a company to write things, then it's in the scope of your employment. Or if you if if someone commissions a work from you, a certain type of work, and there's a written agreement using the words work for hire. In those cases, when the work is produced, then the 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 employer or the corporation is actually the the author, even though they don't exist as a person. So they're considered to be the author. And in those cases, the copyright term would be 95 years instead of life of the creator plus 70, you see. Uh, and one interesting fluke in the law too is uh, – or not fluke, but it's part of the law, which most people don't understand. If you have two or more people jointly create a work, and they don't have to contribute equally to it, but they jointly create a work. You know, Two guys write a novel together. They each have a 100% copyright in it, which in, in other words, they each have the, the, the total right to license other people to copy it without the other guy's permission. So if A and B write a novel together and then they become enemies, A can license to everyone in the world the right to use this novel. Now, if he makes money off of it, he has to share it with the guy, but he can do it. So all you have to do is go to one author to get permission to do something. If he gives you permission, you can use it even if the other guy objects. Um, now, U.S. copyright law, like patent law, is domestic only. It only applies to activity within the territory of the United States that's under the jurisdiction of U.S. law. So when people say China is stealing RIP, usually they're talking about inventions or trade secrets, but sometimes they talk about uh, piracy of copyrighted works too. They're actually literally just wrong. Not only is stealing not what copyright law stops, which I mentioned earlier, it's not. It doesn't prohibit theft. So China can't steal or IP. No one can steal IP because it can be infringed. But China can't infringe your IP because in or no one in China can infringe your IP, or the Chinese government can't because anything they do in China can only violate Chinese law. Now there happens to be a Chinese copyright law, so they would be violating some copyright in China. Maybe because China is part of these – these the Berne Convention and other things too, but they cannot steal US IP. It's like literally impossible. So all these charges are hysterical, and they're kind of racist, and they're kind of insulting to Chinese honor and stuff. I think I mentioned last time what people are talking about is um, 
trade secret espionage or theft caused by leaks from within a factory in China when an American company has a factory over there. But that's got nothing to do with stealing IP really. It's more of a trade secret thing, and we have that problem in the US as well. So this is not some kind of China thing. Um, already mentioned copyrights yeah. automatic ever since the Berne Convention. Um, also, it's almost impossible to get rid of copyright. So the patent system is what you could call an opt-in system. If you don't file a patent on your invention, you don't get a patent. And not only that, if you start making and using it or disclosing it publicly, after a year it becomes public domain. No one else can get a patent on it either, not even you. Like so it becomes public domain. So you lose the right to do it. It's user to lose it in a sense, right? Um, copyrights are automatic and there's no way they're almost inalienable because there's no way to get rid of them. You can assign it. But if you don't assign it in a written agreement assigning it, then you still have a copyright. Um, so you know, you have these laymen – like again, criticize me of being hypocritical for having copyright, although it's automatic and I can't help it. They'll say, well, well, you put a copyright notice on your work as if if I didn't put the copyright notice, I wouldn't have a copyright. Well, that's just false. I would have a copyright. Um, or they say, well, you could just put a little notice on there disclaiming copyright as if they're copyright licensing experts and they know that – Saying these magic words, I disclaim it, works. No, it doesn't work, or it's not clear that it works, right? Uh, because the copyright law doesn't say someone is infringing unless the author said to the wind, I disclaim it, like some magical incantation. Um, now, the Creative Commons group and others have tried to get around this with this Creative Commons license. I assume that over time that's going to get judicial recognition if only by the doctrine of equity called estoppel. But again, as a lawyer, I'm not so clear why Creative Commons works because, again, if someone sees my my book and I have a Creative Commons license saying anyone has the right to use this, then if I sued them, they could maybe sue they could they could have a defense of um, estoppel, saying, well, I relied upon his representation to my to my detriment, and so he's stopped from asserting that defense. But that's not really clearly what would happen. You you can't count on that. So the license idea is that, oh, I say I hereby publish this work under a Creative Commons dash BY license, which means I'm giving a license to anyone um, um, with the condition that they that they that they give me credit, they put my name on it. So as long as they keep my name on it, then they have a permission from me. But do they really? Because the way a license works in the old days was it's a contract between two parties, two identifiable parties that negotiated, came to a meeting of the minds. And the, the licensee the licensee pays pays consideration. Like contracts have to have consideration to be binding. So I wanna I wanna print your book. I have I ask you for a license. You grant me a license in exchange for a fee, which is consideration. We sign the, the license agreement. We know when it was dated. <laughs> we can prove that who we are. If I just put a statement on a book. Who am I granting a license to? Some unknown person? Did we have a meeting of the minds? Um, did he give me any consideration? No. Uh, how how does he prove that he had a license? Uh, what if I publish a a, a, a book on a website? Uh, well, let's say I publish a painting, a, 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 a capture of a, a you know a, a digital version of a painting on my website, and I put a notice saying Creative Commons dash by. Now you take my painting. And you use it to as the cover of your book, and then the next day I take that copyright, I take that Creative Commons notice off my website, and then I sue you for copyright infringement. What, what's your defense? Because it looks like a copyright infringement. Your defense could be, well, I have a license, and where's your proof <laughs> that you remember seeing it on my website? So you're supposed to print this stuff out. How do we know that wasn't doctored, right? So like this whole thing is like. It's like um, – it's it's a rickety way to try to address a stupid problem, and the stupid problem is there's no way to opt out, and the reason is because copyright is not – is now automatic. It used to be you had to register it, so you would know. whether If you didn't register, you didn't have a copyright. If you didn't put a notice on there, you didn't have a copyright, but now it's automatic, but because it's automatic and the law didn't provide a way – the law didn't say if you send a notice to the copyright office, you can disclaim your copyright in a work, and then you don't have copyright. They don't do that. So I'm not even sure if copyright is is opt is opt out. It's not only not opt in, which it should be and it used to be, it's not even opt out because there's no way to get rid of it. Um anyway.
Why did they? Sorry, Stefan. Go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering, why did they change that? What was the rationale for? Well, that was in the Berne Convention from the 1800s and late 1800s. It was always in there. Um, and so when the U.S. decided to finally join the world community in the 1980s and join the Berne Convention for, for the benefits of, of, of being able to influence policy in other countries and things like that um, and, to, and to get uh, recognition of U.S. copyrights in other countries because that's kind of – you have to join the Berne Convention to do it. Um, that's why we have it. We have it because we joined the Berne Convention. Why that was put in the Berne Convention in the late 1800s, I don't know. I don't know what, what I don't know what the debates were that that had that that put in there. Um, probably to make it easier for authors to get copyright, so they wouldn't have to file a registration. I see. Probably that was the reason. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Now, what are the penalties for infringing copyright? Not for theft, but um, well. It, before before the law had statutory damages, you had to prove actual damage. Like, okay, this guy copied my novel, and then I lost ten thousand dollars worth of sales. Probably, you know, you can have an expert witness; they can estimate what your sales probably would have been. Blah blah blah. But you have to prove actual damages. Well, the the copyright said alternatively, you could have statutory damages, um, and statutory damages can be decreed by the court, and they can be up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars per infringing work, like per, per infringing act. Um, and so like one law professor calculated like 12 years ago, so it's probably even higher now, that just taking the average activities all the people here do every day and every month, every year, you know, forwarding emails, copying pictures here and there, cutting and pasting. Um, theoretically, we're all liable for up to $4.5 billion each per year in copyright infringement damages, uh, which is insane, right? Um, that may be at the high end because I think he took the hundred fifty thousand dollar number, which is the the most a judge can use. It could be smaller, but theoretically, <laughs> billions of dollars each, which is obviously absurd. And if you extend this to the AI thing that's happening now, you know AI is probably infringing copyright because it, it uses all these sources and then it does all these internal computations, mixing these things, and then it generates an output, which is probably a derivative work in some sense. And it does – it's billions of times faster than us, so maybe maybe these AI makers are liable for a trillion or a billion times the 4.5 billion. So we're talking quadrillions or, or whatever the next level is, which is obviously absurd, like greater than the value of the whole solar system or something. Um, also, unlike patent law, I believe – I don't think there's a patent law criminal provision that I'm aware of. Um, <clears throat> criminal liability can be attached for willful infringement. Uh, of copyright, and this is why, for example, Aaron Swartz, the guy that helped to create RSS and other things, um, who was a young guy, and he was just trying to make academic journal articles available online. So he was facing up to 35 years in federal prison and a million dollars in fines, and he, he committed suicide. I mean, he was his life was ruined by copyright and threat of threat of prison. Um, there was a guy who was put in prison for a year for uploading this Wolverine movie like 15 years ago, something like that, just uploading one movie to the internet, jail for a year. Um, there was a, a British student named Richard O'Dwyer who was facing being extrad extradition to the United States to, fa to face federal prison time for, for living in England and having a website that didn't have any pirated content on it, but it had – it had I shouldn't use the word pirated – any infringing content, it had links, hyperlinks to other websites that had it, like Russians or whatever. It's crazy, right? He finally got out of it, but his life was almost ruined or derailed for quite a while. Um, so the implications of this is that, as I mentioned earlier in the history, copyright was rooted in state and church censorship and 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 um, uh, control over freedom of the press and ideas. And it's still used to censor today. We have millions of YouTube takedowns a year and other takedowns too. I'm just using YouTube as a, as a conspicuous example. Um, and it means you literally cannot have a book or build upon prior works without permission of someone, and you're, off, you're usually not going to get it. So you couldn't have Star Trek or Star Wars sequels. can't make a sequel or fan fiction unless you want to take the risk, and maybe, maybe Star Trek copyright owners turn a blind eye or they might give you permission, but… Theoretically, they could go after you, right? And they quite often do. And just here's a couple of older examples, which I've I've had for years. I quit I quit collecting examples because there's there's another one every day. But um, so the famous novel Catcher in the Rye, shortly after his death or right before his death, J.D. Salinger, the author, and then later his estate, persuaded U.S. courts to ban the publication 
of a sequel called 60 Years Later Coming – someone wrote a sequel to Catcher in the Rye called 60 Years Later Coming Through the Rye, and they just went to court and said this is derivative work. We don't want it published, so the court blank banned it. This is literally book burning or book banning um, by the government. And you've you've probably seen videos of like you know steamrollers rolling over CDs and things like this. They're, you know they're they're or, or book <laughs> destroying books that are pirated books. Uh, and then there was a, an amusing thing back in 05 when one of the Harry Potter books was coming out. You know the, the copies were sent early, a few days early before the release date to this this bookstore up in Canada, and the the store accidentally sold yeah accidentally I'm sure anyway they sold 14 copies a few days early. And the publishers panicked about this because they, they, you know, they wanted to have their release date, so they went to court and they used copyright law to get a, a, a Canadian judge to issue an order to the customers who bought the book, not to talk about it, not to copy it, not to sell it, which again under the first sale doctrine in Canada and here, I believe, uh, you have the right to if you buy a book that's copyrighted you paid you 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 already implicitly sold paid for the for the copyright license to have it in that book so you can resell it to someone that's why libraries can lend books out the first sale doctrine but the judge says you can't sell it even though you own it and you can't even read it <laughs> until it's officially released on July 16th at midnight um and I collect I used to collect other examples at the link at the bottom my horror files if anyone's interested now, I don't remember if I went into this in the last lecture, but in my view, the two main types of IP, which is patent and copyright, not so much the others, but patent and copyright legally should be viewed as what's called in the in the law is called negative easements. This is the common law, or or negative servitudes in in the civil law, which is the law of um, of, of European countries, uh, in Latin America and Louisiana, my home state. Um, so an, a negative easement is just a contractual restriction or or alienation of part of the rights in your property, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's the basis of restrictive covenants and homeowners association HOA agreements, which I know a lot of libertine libertarians dislike. They want their freedom, but whatever. <laughs> Contractually and legally, there's nothing wrong with an HOA agreement. What it is is you have someone who owns a piece of land, and you 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 grant to your neighbors. The, well, you grant to the owner of neighboring estates, whoever owns a, your neighboring estate, the right to stop you from using your property in certain ways. So people do this like so they, they keep their neighborhood residential or something like that, or they or they prevent houses from being too tall or something. So you still own your house, and you have the right – you're the only one who can use it, but your neighbors have a veto right over how you use it. Like if I want to tear it down and build a factory… I couldn't do it without my neighbor's permission because I've granted them by contract a negative easement or a negative servitude. Nothing wrong with that as long as you grant it by contract or it's consensual. Just like there's nothing wrong with the guy kissing a girl if she consents. But if she doesn't consent, it's assault and battery, right? <laughs> or like se consensual sex is fine, but non-consensual sex, we call that rape, you know. Um, if you punch someone in a boxing ring, it's consented to by the other guy. It's not a battery. But if he doesn't consent, if he doesn't consent to it, and you punch someone in the street, it's battery, right? So consent makes the difference. So um, a negative easement is fine as long as the owner of what we call the burdened estate, that's the state that ha is subject to the negative easement held by others, um, as long as you consent to it <laughs> by contract. <laughs> but the patents and the copyrights is just the government of in effect issuing a negative easement to the owner of that IP right. So the copyright holder. In effect, now has a negative easement over the printing presses and the factories, uh, and the patent owners have a, a negative easement over the factories of everyone else in the country, where they can they have a veto right over how they use their property. So that's a, essentially the problem with patent and copyright law, is that they are non-consensual negative easements. Nothing wrong with consensual negative easements, but the problem is when it's non-consensual. So it's basically a taking of property rights. Uh, Rothbard would classify this as a triangular innovation as opposed to a bi intervention inter intervention as opposed to a binary intervention, but that goes a little bit far afield, but I've talked about that before elsewhere. Uh, and that's the end of it. So now I will open it up for any Q&A. You can ask anything about policy or if you, if you have actually any practical questions for yourself or elaborating on the legal stuff I just talked about. Feel free to, to ask.
Yeah, hey, Stefan, uh, th there was a case I recall from 2020 um, where the US Supreme Court um, said that states are not subject to uh, the, the federal copyright law because of sovereign immunity. Uh, do, you, do you have any insight on that? I remember reading that. I can't remember the details of it. Um, I can't remember the details, sorry. Okay. Do you think that's a good thing? <laughs> I don't remember. I, I don't remember if it if it meant that uh, states themselves couldn't be subject to federal copyright law claims. Like, could a citizen of the U.S. who has a federal copyright sue the state for using that? Um, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. I mean, usually when the question is like, how would you change copyright law, or has this current change? By a judicial decision, is it a good thing? If it weakens copyright law and its effect, it's a good thing. So, if it weakens the ability of someone to sue, on the other hand, states are evil, so I don't mind states being sued. So, I don't know. That's a that's a tough one. <laughs> I would I would abolish the copyright law and states so that there would be no states to sue, and there would be no copyright law that an author could sue under. So, that's how I would approach it. Stefan, can I have a question on Section 230, please? Yeah. You know, that's supposed to give immunity to publishers from what other people post on their platforms, right? Is this supposed I to... Uh, I think it's more for platforms, internet service right. providers, not publishers. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, right. Okay, platform, like Twitter, Facebook. Now, what if Facebook or Twitter specifically, what if they come up with a uh, defamatory statement, like Alex Berenson's case, I believe he sued Twitter in California and they threw it down because of section 230, even though it wasn't anybody on Twitter defame, defaming Alex Berenson, it was actually Twitter themselves. They banned him, and they said they banned him because he lied or something. Else. Um, I so. don't know the details of that. I've heard Berenson, but um, uh, my understanding of 230 – and by the way, 230 is very convoluted. It's hard to understand, uh, although I think Mike Masnick on Tech Dirt has some good posts kind of unpacking all the bad arguments used to – like people say things like, well, 230 – is only applicable if the platform doesn't become a publisher and start and start moderating the activity. And therefore, nowadays these tech platforms are, are steering what shows up, and so therefore they should be considered a publisher. And two thirty shouldn't apply. I think that's actually legally incorrect. That's not how two thirty works, uh, and that it was never the way it was meant to work. And I don't think it should work that way. I personally don't think we should water down two thirty. Um, the only problem I have with two thirty is that I think it might violate federalism because. Defamation law is a state law-based thing by and large, and so what you have is you have a federal law saying in state courts they can't have a defamation ca case in this in this circumstance against a platform. Um, I mean I like that rule, but I think it probably violates federalism, but I'm not going to cry too loud about it. Now, if, if a court actually said that Berenson's defamation claim against Twitter… For what they said is barred by 230. I think that's just wrong. My understanding of 230 that's wrong. All 230 says is that Twitter can't be secondarily liable for the defamatory acts of one of their users. Okay. So basically, defamation means whoever makes the defaming comment, he's primarily liable. Right. And so if someone posts on Twitter a defaming comment, Twitter did not make that comment. But without 230, you could argue that they're that they're um, they should be vicariously liable or secondarily liable because they they induced it or they contributed to it by providing the platform and benefiting financially from it. There's all these doctrines under copyright law. I think there must be similar ones for defamation law. So you could have a common law claim. You would have to sue the actual speaker, the person who the user who spoke. So you'd say he's liable, and Twitter is also liable secondarily. And jointly with him, right? Um, just like if a kid does something to you, you, 
Well, like if an employee of a corporation does something, you should he has to be negligent. You can sue him, but then you can sue his employer under respondeat superior for vicarious responsibility for his acts. So you sue them both basically. If the employer is not liable, then the employee if the employee is not liable, the employer is not liable. Similarly, in this case, um, whoever makes a defaming comment. It's always liable under defamation law, and 230 doesn't change that. So I don't know the details of this case. That that does there must be something wrong either in the decision or maybe in the way you're recounting it. But I, I I can't imagine that Twitter would be off the hook for what they said under 230. I could be wrong. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I had a question, Stefan. Um, so taking the example of the guy who wrote a sequel to Catcher in the Rye yeah. and Salinger stopped the publication of that. Yeah. You know, what if this guy out of spite, you know, like posted the whole thing for free online said, I'm not going to try to make any money off of it, but I Correct. want what I've seen to go out into the world and whatever. Um, what could they do to him then? Okay. So yeah. And remember this case was, years ago way before the internet existed so i think back then his oh, you know it, it was easy to it, it, you know the gatekeepers had more power back then when the mm -hmm. when, when just like you know just like uh, you know the case for bitcoin is that uh, you don't need you don't have to go through a gatekeeper who can stop stop your money transaction uh, but mm -hmm. back then when you had to go through a major publisher or like there was only a few self publishing up it was easy for the court to like say no we're going to stop this right here um mm -hmm. So they could actually prevent it, from, like, and I don't think the the copies never got out. I think they were able to snuff it out. Mm -hmm. um, but in today's world, yeah, if he just posted it online, um, uh, it'd be too late to stop it. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, if if they uh, if they could find out who did it, then he could be sued for copyright infringement, just like the Wolverine guy. He uploaded one copy to the internet, and he got a year in prison for doing that because then mm -hmm. millions of people could copy it, right? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, now, you know. So what I would do is, if I wanted to do that, I would do it anonymously, so they couldn't they couldn't catch me. It's hard to do that when you're publishing a printed book, but you know, with the internet, you could publish it anonymously. But let's mm -hmm. suppose you could find out who the guy was. Yeah, he could be in trouble for that. Um, and also, you could go after anyone else that you could identify who was who was downloading it because they're copying it. Um, so all the thousands of people downloading it, but I, I imagine they're doing it behind Tor or some encryption, so it'd be hard to mm -hmm. hard to catch them too. But um yeah well if so if you know someone had a sequel of capture in the rye for example they they post it for free online and you know they they have identified themselves as the author mm -hmm. but maybe they by posting it for free if they tried to claim some fair use by saying well i'm not profiting from this and i i know that this happens there's all kinds of harry potter fan fiction websites and stuff and so i'm sure it's all been litigated but you know in this Catcher in the Rye example, could they, I mean, would the estate possibly still go after them for a copyright infringement, even if the person yeah. tried to make no money? Yeah, and I think they would still win. See, that's another thing. Most people think, well, if it's non-commercial, it's fair use. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, that's only one of the four factors. Mm -hmm. um, and again, and even the non-commercial part is not non-commercial. It says not, I think it says non-commercial educational. Mm -hmm. So it has to be sort of educational and non-commercial just to satisfy that one factor. But probably the other the other three would be um, – the other three would probably weigh in the author's favor, and um, or at least two of them, and, and then my guess is that the court or the judge would side with the uh, the author. So I don't think being non-commercial is going to help you very much. Mm -hmm. So, Stephen, I have a question about um, – it is much more concerning to the – previous lecture about uh, when we were talking about the uh, intellectual property rights on the religious images as far as I remember and this is thing that I have uh, seen and heard for the first time in my life that uh, the religious images have a special some kind of protection in the American life. Could you uh, talk a little bit about it? Uh, oh yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't mean in the law. Although it could be the law in some countries, like um, in Sharia law, it probably is part of the law in Sharia law. Um, no, I, I just meant that the uh, uh, I meant that um, the fact that in the fact that everyone is afraid to print certain images of certain prophets 
because of <laughs> physical retaliation, as in Charlie Hebdo, um, is very similar to it, it's a copyright like thing, but it's is done by more of a private uh, a private uh, mafia, so to speak, than than actual recognized state. But it's it, in form, it's the same thing. And states are mafias too, <laughs> with just per perception of legitimacy. That's the only difference. Um, so that's all I mean. I was just analogizing it. I was. I'm basically saying that you, uh, that Western copyright law is very similar to the way these these people treat these religious images. I see. I have not thought about it in this way. Well, you know, if you take my if you take my negative easement analogy, if you're too broad with it, almost every bad law you could say is like that. So, for example, if you don't pay your taxes, you go to prison, or if you don't uh, – if you do drugs that are illegal, you go to prison. So you could classify that as um, in a way the state claiming a negative easement over your body, so they're saying… You can't use your body for these uses unless we give you permission. But I think that's stretching the legal classification too far because it's better to just call that aggression because basically the state is using aggression against you when you didn't do anything wrong. That's what aggression is. So the state's using physical force to put you in prison when you did when you have not committed any kind of actual natural crime. Um, now, by the same token, you could call that you could say that's what the true for patent and copyright because. You know, ultimately, if I if I publish a book that the and the, the court tells me not to publish this sequel and I publish it anyway, you know, I might go to prison for contempt of court. Or if you know, if they try to collect money money from me and I refuse to let them take it and I, I defend my property with my gun, they're going to shoot me. So in a sense, all laws are backed by force, and in a sense, almost all bad laws can be called a negative easement. But I think. It's it's it makes more sense from a legal classification and an explanatory sense to basically to call patent and copyright um, negative easements because they're very similar to the way negative easements work. They're just non-consensual. That's the one difference. It's it's not so easy to call trademark and trade secret law negative easements. Um, it's it, it's it's you can classify them in different ways, but they're all unjust and they all violate property rights. I see. So is this fair use doctrine based on the common law or is it a statu statutory one? Well, there's – so first of all, there's no in, – in the U.S., there's no such thing as federal common law uh, because federal – I see. Yes, yes. Federal law came from the Constitution, which is basically a statute, and then there's federal statutes, which Congress enacts. But although the states inherited the British common law because they were the colonies of England and they already had in their common law courts and the private law systems common law… There's no such thing as federal common law, um, not really, um, and that's why in in the 1900s I can't, or maybe the 1800s there was a, a decision – the Erie Doctrine, E-R-I-E. It was a railroad case. Um, a decision was made that federal courts, because they don't have any common law, when they hear – I think what they call a diversity case where like a citizen from one state sues a citizen from another state. That's when you can go to federal court. Um, the court – the district court, the federal district court. What law does he apply? So the answer was he has to apply the state law in that state as federal law. Anyway, but what happens is when the federal government interprets federal statutes, they have to they have to interpret it. And over time, that precedent, that body of case law develops over time. It's it's not really common law because they're not really making it up from uh, from a dispute between people based upon reasons or, or the ancient common law, but they're interpreting federal statutes. But over time, a body of law develops that, that interprets that, and that's what happened with copyright law. So copyright law was a statute in 1790, and then there were amendments made or replacements made over the ensuing decades. So every time there's a copyright dispute before a federal court, they're interpreting a federal statute, and some judge or some court find, eventually started inventing the fair use factor, so they invented it. You can call it common law, but it's really just a judicial invention as a way of interpreting a statute. And then in the 1900s, the, co the Congress revised the Copyright Act or replaced it with a new one. I can't remember, and when they did that, they decided to codify the factors that the judges had previously developed. So that's where those four factors come from. The four factors come from judicial decisions, but now they're in the law. So they're actually in the copyright statute now. I see. I see. Because, uh, for example, in Poland, uh, we have a similar doctrine of 
fair use, but um, all of those parts of those important, legally important parts are simply codified. And for example, if uh, based on the Article 23 of the Polish copyright law, if I have a book or I have even an ebook, so to say, uh, I can borrow it or send it to the like my family, to my uh, colleagues, with, which I know personally, to use it for a, the, the educational uh, means. And you, you mean, you mean the actual copy. book, or you mean the actual book, or a copy? Both. I can make okay. uh, copies for myself as much huh. as I want. For example. Yes, and in the U.S., if you make a copy, like a backup copy for yourself, like of a of a of a movie on a CD or of a book, and if a library makes a copy for backup purposes. That is sometimes considered fair use too, but only because of the way the four factors play out. I think my my understanding is that in in most European countries, the the doctrine that's similar to the U.S. doctrine of fair use, I believe they call it fair dealing, but it's 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 very similar to the U.S. I believe. Yes, I believe so. Anyone else? Yeah, you mentioned uh, joint authors of copyrighted works uh, yep. could license stuff without the agreement of the other all without the agreement of the other author. Um, is it similar for patented patented patents, or how does that work? I used to know this. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Um... I don't actually recall. Maybe I'll look it up and I'll put it in the uh, modified slides. But um, yeah, because if you have yeah, if you have two or more inventors, then they're co-inventors. They all have to be listed on the patent, and they are presumed to be the owners unless they work for a corporation, in which case the employer owns it, which is the main case. Usually, it's the employer. So. Um, it, it's only one person there. It's not a, not a problem. But if you have two owners of a patent. I'm, I can't recall. I'm sorry. I'm sure there's a black letter answer to it, but uh, I think it is different than copyright, but I can't remember how. I kind of would imagine it being like a joint venture, um, but I I'm sure you'll figure it out. Yeah. Well, if I have time for more, but if there's no more, I will go ahead and end this now. And I think what I will do, if everyone, if anyone thinks this is a good idea, uh, maybe I'll do part three, maybe next week, um, and I'll try to cover the other types of IP. And that might take two lectures. I don't know. We'll have to see how it goes. Uh, and then if there's anything else remaining, we can, I don't know, cover anything else. Or maybe these three will be enough just to give people a good primer on how modern IP law actually works in the real world. Um, any other suggestions or questions before we before we go? Yes, I had one other question. Okay. Um, as far as copywriting uh, facts and stuff, um, there was there was a time like ten years ago or so. I was I reached out to an author of a book. Uh, he'd written a biography of someone, and I wanted to. I asked if I could. I don't know. I basically, I really just wanted to look at his research and his archive, uh, right. be able to see what stuff he had. And, you know, his initial response was just, uh, well, you need to sign this uh, licensing agreement or, you know, and he was treating it as I was adapting his uh, biography. And I don't remember if he claimed this or if I talked to someone else and they explained this, but they were kind of saying, now, if this author had done interviews with this musician, and if his research is the only source of these facts about the musician's life, and I used them in some work, then um, he can claim some copyright in those facts, because, I don't know, I would be pulling it from his book, which is the only source of it or something. Are you familiar with anything like that? Well, first of all, Quite often authors are confused about copyright law, and they do things that are unnecessary, or they say things that are wrong, or they don't even understand their own rights. So mm -hmm. 
him saying something doesn't mean it's correct. Um, mm -hmm. um, that sounds inaccurate to me. I don't think that. So no, you 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 don't have a copyright in facts, and um, and copyright law does not prevent you from looking at something, even if there's a copyright in the work you're looking at. Okay. And using the data in there, there's nothing in copyright the law that pre prevents that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just – if he thought that, he's just mistaken about how IP works, which he, uh -huh. he might have been because it's a convoluted field. Now, there, the, so, the, so for example, there's a, there's a complicated thing where um, – let's suppose you have – you want to publish correspondence between two authors, which – say I think Walter Block did this a few years back, uh, his letters with Milton Friedman. You know, there's other books of you know like Thomas Jefferson's correspondence, or um, mm -hmm. of course that's so old it wouldn't matter. Um, you know, there was one I read, Jasper Crane and Rose Wilder Lane, their correspondence. So if someone writes me a letter, you know, let's say let's say Murray Rothbard writes me a letter, I can use that that piece of paper however I want. I can display it in a museum. Mm -hmm. I can I can I can show it. Um, I could I can sell tickets to people to come to my house and take a look at it. <laughs> But but the author is the one who owns the copyright. So Rothbard still owns the copyright to it. So I can't publish it in a book without his permission unless there's fair use, which there probably is not. So if I wanted to publish my correspondence with Rothbard, let's say we wrote 50 letters to each other back and forth. I could publish the ones I wrote to him if I kept a copy. He might have all my copies, and I might have all his copies. So I might be unable – like in the old days, I might be unable to publish my own book, my own stuff because I don't have a copy anymore. Mm -hmm. Why people started doing carbon copies, right? So they have their own copy. <clears throat> so I only have a copyright in my stuff. I might have to summarize his. I <laughs> say I wrote him this, and then he said something effectively like this. So that's why you usually. So like I think when Rothbard, I'm sorry, when Walter Block wanted to publish his correspondence with Milton Friedman, um, I think he had to get permission of either Friedman if he was still alive or his estate um, to publish that correspondence in that in that journal article. Um, so that, go ahead. does that mean you could publish like a facsimile of those written letters, but not just the text? No, that would be a copy too. Okay. I could publish a summary of it because again, the, the information in it is not copyright. The, the ideas are not copyright. So, so for example, I'm, I actually might be publishing a book. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say later. And it's a collection of essays by other people. And hmm. one of them is by someone I think, Will not grant me a copyright in his piece. Oh, uh, here's a better example. Uh, if I wanted to publish uh, um, a book and with of essays, and one of them was by a Randian, you know, like uh, uh, and the Randians are notoriously they hate libertarians and they and and they're copyright fanatics. They would probably not give me permission to to reprint that article. So what I would do is I was in my book chapter twelve might say. Uh, I would have the same title as the author's thing. You know, I'd say article X by person Y. And then I would have I would say something like, you know, they refuse to give me permission, but I'm gonna in the next few pages, I'm gonna summarize what their argument was, or I'm gonna restate their argument. So I would tell mm -hmm. you what their argument says. And they mm -hmm. can't stop that. They can't stop that. That's why people do cliff notes of of books, and that's permissible. I think that's why. A cliff note is just you rewording and saying in summary form what a book says. Mm-hmm. You're not using their language, so you're not copying it. Mm -hmm. By the way, tr uh, not only sequels and movie versions of novels, but s translations are also considered um, uh, derivative works. So if I if I wrote a book and someone wants to trans translate it into another language, they have to get the author's permission for that too. Mm -hmm. But so so if you in the example of the letter that you said, if you had a letter from Rothbard and you publicly exhibited it and charged money for people to look at it or whatever, you would be allowed to do that as the owner yes. of the letter. But yeah, because I'm not I'm not I'm not because I'm not copying it and I'm not making a new work based upon it. I'm just using my copy as and I could sell the letter to someone too under the first sale doctrine. But and by the way, I could destroy the letter. A photograph of the letter you could not do. No, I, may, I maybe <laughs> could make a photograph for my backup copy, but I, I uh -huh. you know, then then you get dodgy about what your purpose is. But um, mm -hmm. by the way, if if this was in Europe, I might not be able to destroy the letter because of moral <laughs> rights. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs>
<laughs> and then what about uh, life rights? Um, just as an example, if you wanted to write a book about a person, a, a true person, uh, or make a movie or something, I've heard that in a lot of cases, you need that person's permission to be able to do that. Um, that that could be the producers or their lawyers being risk averse and extra careful. Um, mm -hmm. But there is something which I'm I don't know a good deal about, but there's something called rights of publicity, which is sort of like an ancillary type of IP type right. Um, mm -hmm. So under rights of publicity, if you're trying to profit off of someone's likeness and that kind of stuff, you have to get their permission. I don't know a good deal about that type of law. Um, I, I do think my impression is that if you wanted to – like, let's say I, – I mean look. Uh, there was a movie just made about Elizabeth Holmes, uh, a documentary on mm -hmm. um, I don't know Showtime or HBO, one of those. It was called um, – the Dropout, which is actually excellent, and then of course there's been recent movies, recent miniseries made about uh, Adam, what's his name from WeWork, and also um, the guy from uh, from Uber. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one made um, about uh, inventing Anna, about that uh, th that woman who defrauded people of money. Although she might have mm -hmm. given permission, but I don't think that um, the WeWork guy or the Uber guy or Elizabeth Holmes granted permission. To the people um, to make those documentaries, so I think you're entitled to do that if it's a matter mm -hmm. of public interest. I don't think that's the same thing as violating their publicity rights. I think if you violate the publicity rights, that's when you need to get their permission. But I don't know exactly what that entails because so I've never practiced that type of law. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, in the dropout, I believe in that one, the documentary is based upon a book that someone wrote and that someone just did research, like a journalist did research on what happened and he presented it in a book. And the documentary was a derivative work or based upon that book, so they got the permission of the author of the book. But I don't think the author of the book had to get permission of the subject of the book, Elizabeth Holmes. Mm -hmm. I believe that's the case. I, I'm not a deep expert on that type of law. My main mm -hmm. expertise has been in patent and copyright and some trademark, but I think that's the way, the way it works. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, everybody. Well, I guess I'll stop here, but I appreciate your attention and your time. And uh, any of you feel free to email me or contact me if you want have any suggestions about the next one. But otherwise, I'll probably plan to do one next Thursday. That would be the May the – well, today's the 27th of May, 2023 for people listening in the far future, and today's Thursday. So whatever next May is, May 4th or 5th, whatever that is. Um, same time, 2 o'clock Central Time. Um, I never know whether to say Central Standard Time or Daylight Time because I don't know which one we're on. And um, I'll try to cover as many of the other types of IP as I can and uh, go from there. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.